The day after the Portuguese Grand Prix, the Supreme Soviet of the USSR granted President Gorbachev special powers for 18 months in order to secure the country's transition to a full market economy. The question was whether this would be enough to delay the rapid unravelling of the Union as a whole as the demands for national independence grew all over, even in Russia itself. The National Cathedral in Washington DC was finally finished after 83 years in construction, which sounds like a lot but was positively rapid compared to medieval cathedrals on which the architecture was based. There had been no such central church planned when Washington was originally laid out as the founding fathers, particularly Alexander Hamilton, wanted to ensure that the new nation was free from the kind of religious splits that had bedeviled Europe. But in the late 19th century, amid a revival in religious feeling, the cathedral had been approved and the first foundation stones laid in 1907. President Bush was present for the placing of the final finial on the church where he had held a prayer service after his inauguration the previous year, and which would see his own state funeral in 2018. And at the weekend, while the F1 teams were hard at work in Hereth, the United Nations in New York hosted the World Summit for Children. Heads of state from 72 nations and representatives of 87 more were in attendance, the largest ever gathering of heads of state at the time, and agreed a platform of goals that the world should strive to achieve, including the eradication of diseases such as polio and guinea worm disease, improving conditions for pregnant women and new mothers and access to family planning, securing universal access to safe drinking water and reducing malnutrition. Unlike most such pious declarations, however, a system was actually set in place for measuring success, with a report back scheduled for 2002. The last European round of the Formula One season would be in Hereth once more and saw a few more pieces of the jigsaw slot into place for 1991. Williams called a press conference, which caused an excited buzz, which turned out to be to announce that Ricardo Patrese had signed a contract extension, lovely for him, but not the news everyone was expecting. Thierry Boutsen, meanwhile, had signed a two-year deal with Ligier, which most people felt all but confirmed that Nigel Mansell would be back, but still no word yet. Meanwhile, despite another indifferent season, both Capelli and Gugelman had re-signed with Leighton House. Rory Byrne was about to leave Benetton for Reynard, who were preparing an F1 project to launch in 1992. This would be his last race in charge, while there were rumours that Brabham were looking at Roberto Moreno as a replacement for Tyrrell-bound Stefano Modena, who had announced his engagement to Sveva Altieri, a scion of a Roman noble family which had produced, among other luminaries, Pope Clement X. Otherwise, everything was pretty much as it had been in Portugal, with Bernd Schneider returning to Arrows to substitute for Alex Caffey, who was still recovering after his shunt in Estoril. With the unification of Germany officially due to happen just three days after the race, Schneider would thus become the last West German to enter Formula One. And Alan Prost had expressed his frustration at the, quote, lack of management and strategy, end quote, at Maranello, for which read Cesare Fiorio, and hinted he might look for another team in 1991, a senior Fiat executive was flown out to smooth things over, which seemed to mollify him. And without further ado, off they went for pre-qualifying, which resulted in the same four going through as for the last three races, with Dalmas top of the timings, followed by Tarquini, Guiar and Gasho, with Moreno just missing out by two hundredths, and Langer's the closest he'd come all season, just 1.133 seconds off a place in the next session. The life engineers, after another all-nighter, did manage to keep the engine cover on this time, but the car still failed after just two laps. Senna was quickest as usual during Friday qualifying, but early in the session Martin Donnelly felt something break at the front of his Lotus at the high-speed turn 14, sending him into a huge crash, tearing his car apart and leaving him lying still strapped to his seat, unconscious in the middle of the track. The session was stopped as Martin, alive despite initial appearances but seriously injured, was evacuated to hospital. A shaken paddock reconvened the next day, with Senna having visited the scene of the accident and seeming in contemplative mood, while Lotus had left the decision of whether to withdraw or race down to Derek Warwick. Derek decided to race, and indeed put in an excellent lap to qualify 10th, but it was at in Senna's day once more as he took his 50th career pole position, just under half a second ahead of Prost in second, with Mansell third and a delighted a lazy fourth, and first in Saturday's warm-up session. Berger and Patrese shared row three, with Bootson and PK behind them, and Nanini ninth alongside Warwick. Martini put in a great lap too, placing his Minardi 11th alongside Gugelman, with Alios Ligier an encouraging 13th. Both AGSs made it into the race for the first time this year, either side of Donnelly's 23rd place time, with Modena and Alboreto making up the back row. 
With Donnelly obviously unable to race, a petition went round to allow David Brabham 27th fast to start, but it didn't get enough signatures, and so just as in Estoril, it would be a 25 car grid on Sunday, with the Australian joining an increasingly struggling Paolo Barilla, a rusty burnt Schneider who'd missed a gear and been rear-ended by Prost, and Bertrand Gacho on the sidelines. As usual, the Spanish Grand Prix had a rather sparse crowd, despite the importance of the race and the history of good races at the Jerez circuit. Those that were there were enjoying beautiful weather on a still sunny day. The wind had dropped now, but a stiff breeze overnight had deposited a fine layer of sand on the track, and most pundits thought that the race would have at least one or possibly two tyre stops for most drivers. Not only that, but the clean line that developed on the track during warm-up was over on the left, where Prost would be starting, while Senna in pole was on the dirty side, something he wasn't entirely happy about. The lights went green and away they went, with a lazy getting squeezed over by Berger and Patrese going round the outside, but a light contact was made somewhere just enough to tip a lazy end over end into the gravel trap and out of the race. A few others bounced across the grass too, while Pirro's throttle was clogged by sand and he spun out, but up front Senna had held the lead with Prost and Mansell behind him, then Berger and the Williams twins, Patrese with a slightly bent front wing but able to continue. With limited places to overtake at Hereth, Senna, Prost and Mansell were pulling away a bit from Berger, but everyone seemed content to drive a tactical race and await an opportunity and or the first round of pit stops, while Tarquini fell by the wayside with an engine failure after lap 6, and Modena, unseen, was nerfed off by the other AGS of Dalmas on the same lap. Not a great engagement present for Stefano. His teammate for next year, Satori Nakajima, didn't go a lot further, spinning off on lap 14 to end Ken Tyrrell's weekend rather prematurely. But if there were no changes in the order, Prost wasn't letting Senna get away and was hounding his every move, with Mansell also sticking with them ready to take advantage of any mistake. 20 laps in of the 73 scheduled, and Mansell was the first of the leaders to peel in for a tyre stop. 8.6 seconds with a slightly sticky throttle, and out he went in 7th, with Petrese also coming in that lap. Two laps later, Berger made a greased lightning stop despite being on the harder tyres as Bernard's gearbox gave up the ghost, which meant that Senna and Prost now led Boots and PK, Mansell and Warwick at the end of lap 22, before Derek made his own stop and Alio spun out of his last appearance in Europe for the Ligier team. Mansell on his new tyres set a new fastest lap as Senna and Prost continued going at it hammer and tongs at the front, whilst Berger put in a personal fastest lap that was nearly two seconds quicker than his team leader. Clearly, stopping was the right move, but which of the two championship contenders would come in first? Both teams had their tyres out. Would they come in together? No. Prost peeled in on lap 25. Ferrari had had some sticky pit stops recently, but this one went fine, out in 6.17 seconds. A couple of laps later, McLaren went even better, changing Senna's tyres in 5.7 seconds. He emerged from the pit lane right behind Mansell, who was just in the middle of letting Prost through. There was a slightly hair-raising moment when it looked like Nigel might block Senna or even take him out, but the McLaren was soon passed. All of which meant that on lap 27, Nelson Piquet led a race for the first time since Monza 87, and as the Benetton team had often done this season, was running hard tyres and aiming to go through non-stop. Soon Prost and Senna were right on his tail though, and struggling for grip he went wide across the grass and Prost was through into the lead with Senna in tow. So, Prost now led, setting a new fastest lap and leaving Senna in his dust, as it became obvious that the McLaren just wasn't as good on the twisty circuit and he'd been holding up Prost earlier. Senna knew, though, that he was still in the best championship position, even if Prost won, and had said in advance he'd be quite happy to come second today, not least because he was confident that Ferrari just didn't have the reliability to take the title. Mansell, meanwhile, had charged back up to Piquet and was trying to get through, while both were closing on Senna, who was definitely cruising, but was starting to look like he might actually have some sort of problem as well, as half-distance came and went. Piquet was having problems of his own, waving Mansell through before rolling in with a dud battery. A very long stop to change it, and off he went again, but out of contention. He didn't last much longer anyway, pulling into Ritar on lap 48. So Prost now led by a country mile, with Senna second and Mansell right on his tail. Berger came in for a second set of tyres on lap 44, emerging 7th behind the Williams twins and Nanini, and proceeded to go charging off to catch up. Prost made a second stop of his own, having pulled out a huge lead. So good was the stop, he was still 17 seconds ahead afterwards, while Senna's car now looked to be smoking. It was actually water vapour from a punctured radiator, but Senna couldn't see it and thought he must have a puncture. Mansell went through, then Nanini and Bootsen followed as Senna came in for new tyres and set off again, now 6th. 
so Prost led Mansell, Nunini, Boots and Berger in Senna as Warwick made his second stop from ninth, but on lap 54 Senna's radiator finally ran out of steam, literally, his engine temperature spiked, and that was that. He got out and examined his right rear tyre again, still trying to work out what had happened. If things stayed as they were for the remaining third of the race, it would be the best possible result for both championships in terms of keeping them open, as a win for Prost and a Ferrari 1-2 would both go some way to reducing the deficit to Senna and McLaren. Behind Mansell, Nanini was being left behind as he soldiered on on his harder tyres, while a great scrap was developing over fourth between Bootsen and Berger, a scrap that was ended on lap 56 when the Austrian lunged through at the last corner, tripped over the Belgian and went bouncing into the gravel to cap a dreadful day for McLaren, as Thierry went on his merry way. That put Gugelman up into the points, just in time to be lapped by Prost, but Capelli's eighth place was as good as he would do before he came in to retire on lap 61, lifted out of his car with agonising cramp. Gugelman was passed on lap 62 by a flying Suzuki, and soon Warwick was passed two into seventh, only for his gearbox to give up the ghost almost immediately. Somehow, Derek still found a smile for the Williams pit as he walked in. And that was it for racing. Prost and Mansell cruised to a triumphant 1-2 finish to take the World Championship race at least as far as Suzuka, if not all the way to the season-ending 500th Formula 1 Grand Prix in Adelaide. But Prost still needed to win both of those races, while a win for Senna in either would definitely give him the title. Maximum points for Ferrari and none for McLaren, took the prancing horse to the 100-point mark and to within just 18 of the lead. Alessandro Nanini drove a solid race with no stops to take third, his third podium of the year which put him in seventh overall, followed by Boots and Patrese and Suzuki, taking his second point and LaRusse's fifth points finish of the season. Unusually, the top six were all on the lead lap, with Larini passing Gugelman for seventh, Dalmas taking his second finish of the year in ninth, and Alboreto bringing up the rear. A three-week gap now for everyone to pack up and get ready for the two flyaway races, and the day after the race Nigel Mansell made the least surprising announcement of the year, that he would indeed be returning to Williams to partner Riccardo Patrese for 1991. News for Martin Donnelly, meanwhile, was mixed. His life was now out of danger, but with contusions to the brain and lung, and two broken legs, one so badly smashed it nearly needed amputating, among other injuries, there was no question of him driving again this year, and a big question mark over whether he ever would again, and Lotus had a seat to fill for Japan. When someone escapes from an accident uh, as that, uh, obviously uh, there's other people involved that helped him survive that day. Obviously uh, the good Lord was really looking after us, I think, because anybody that survives an accident that big, um, it's just a miracle.